Obviously, raising money and micromobility is uh, a topic that is near and dear to a lot of startups' hearts. Uh, and so I, we've, we've been really excited to be able to assemble an amazing panel today of, of top VCs from around, around the world, actually, uh, to come and talk to you about that today. So I'm going to invite them up as they, as they are. Uh, Aline, if I, I could get you up first. So Aline sure. is at Panuk. Uh, and a round of applause for Aline. <laughs> Hi. Fantastic. And Jorn. So Jorn is at Catapult. He's coming in from Oslo. And then Kevin. Kevin is from Relay Ventures, coming in from LA, Trump, Toronto. Trump. Yes, yep, beautiful, fantastic. All right, well, take a seat. We'll, uh, we'll get started. So I think maybe what we can do is if we just start off with, like, to give context for everybody a little bit on who you are and where you're coming from and that sort of thing. So uh, if we could, maybe we'll go from you, Kevin, down. Uh, just, you know, a bit about yourself, the fund, how, you, how you've been. Sure, so Relay Ventures uh, started 2008, was formed through the uh, merger of two venture funds that got started in the late 90s, so we've been around for a while. Uh, four focus areas, urban tech is uh, the one that I head up, and that's where we do all of our mobility-related investments. Our strategy is to uh, be a full life cycle investor, writing the first check in at the seed or pre-seed stage, so we wanna be in at the very first level. We'll keep writing checks all the way through the life cycle of a company. And uh, in terms of micromobility, um, I'm an investor and board member of Bird. Um, so that's as micromobility as I can get. Yeah, that's, um, well, that's very micromobility. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, it is micromobility. <laughs> it is micromobility, yeah. yeah. Um, and I have a number of other companies um, earlier stage that are involved in micromobility. Uh, there's a, a very interesting uh, data uh, company called Populous. Um, and. Um, I've got a company, most of our investments are in North America. Um, we have very opportunistically looked at European startups. I've got one company in Berlin um, that does um, uh, uh, vehicle software. So really software-defined vehicles, the core concept behind really what drives micromobility. Fantastic, yeah. excellent. All right, thank you, Kevin. Jorn. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Jorn, I'm an investment director at Catapult. We're impact investors. Since 2017, we've been investing in around 20 companies per year. Our pace is 30 now, so we're, uh, we're keeping it up. We do global seed stage climate tech. Climate tech is a bunch of things. Mobility is clearly one of them. Call it mobility urbanization. We, we like cities. We like uh, industries that are changing. Uh, we also like enabling technologies and, and energy, obviously. So mobility is a part of what we do, but at heart, we're seed investors. So that's what we try to understand. What makes a company go from zero to one? Like what makes a company work? And that's my, that's my specialty and, and domain. Uh, of relevant investments, 146 portfolio companies. So it's a whole bunch. We don't take board seats. That's how we make it work. <laughs> and uh, uh, we've invested in two companies that are here today, actually. Uh, Gleam, they do uh, really fancy electric cargo bikes. And we, they do really fancy renting uh, of, uh, well, what is the car replacement for urban families? Uh, electric cargo bikes, if anyone didn't get that. Yep. Uh, that's what we do. And they're based also up in, in Norway. And they're, they're based in Norway, yeah. And the winner of last year's Startup Awards, yeah. actually, at the Micromobility Europe. Whole uh, fit pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We try to invest mostly outside of Norway. We're five and a half million people. There aren't that many ideas. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. All right. Elin? Yeah. I'm Elina. I'm an associate at Ponuk. Ponuk is a venture capital fund based in Amsterdam, and we focus mainly on mobility and also everything uh, on the intersection of mobility and sustainable energy. Um, we're a 140 million euros fund. Uh, with which we invest in Series A rounds, um, looking at tickets from ranging from 1 to 4 million euros. Uh, but we are quite flexible, so we can go a bit earlier or a bit later as well. Um, yeah, we have a single LP, which I think uh, is interesting to note. So that is Pond Holdings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the dream. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, it could be a nightmare. Yeah, it could be or a nightmare. Yeah, yeah it depends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can be both, I guess. But uh, yeah, Pond Holdings, they're a Dutch family owned business. Um, yeah, they once started with a small bike shop in Amersfoort and grew out to be a global mobility conglomerate. Um, yeah, they're active in a few mobility sectors, one of them being automotive. We're the first to import Volkswagen to the Netherlands after the Second World War, and are now the sole importer of the Volkswagen Group, but are also importing cars in the US or Vietnam, for example. And they're also quite big in bicycles, and owning multiple bicycle brands such as Gazelle, but also Focus, Santa Cruz, Cannondale. 
Um, but I think what's interesting to note as well is that we're not a corporate venture capital fund. Uh, we don't invest strategically for Pond Holdings, we invest for financial return. Um, so, yeah, we have an independent IC uh, and we don't need any approval from any divisions from Pond Holdings. So I think, yeah. That's really good context. Okay, um, wonderful. Look, I, I, I feel in some ways, actually, I have no idea if anybody knows who I am, so I just want to like announce that part as well, which is I'm Oliver Bruce. I'm the co-host of the Micromobility Podcast. I'm also an angel investor in micromobility, so I've got about 10 investments in micromobility, and I'm a principal at Blackbird Ventures in New Zealand, which is the largest uh, fund in Australasia. That's context. Okay, very excited for this conversation. Um, I wanted to kind of give what I've seen a little bit as context for, for, for the conversation, because I, I, I've been doing the podcast since 2018, and we have, we've had these sort of waves of craziness that have come through the, through the market. So we had, uh, w right about when Horace and I started the podcast, it was, we, we saw kind of the total explosion of, of Bird and, the, and Lime and a lot of these kind of early uh, micromobility sharing companies. And, and then subsequently kind of obviously a bit of a crash around that and publicly obviously they haven't done as well since they've gone public with Halbers and, and, and Bird not performing. Well, the valuation hasn't done as well. The valuation. The business, the business is not. Point. And that is, really, okay, so yeah. that is actually but, a really good point, right? Yeah. So I think it's what we've seen is like giant bubbles in valuations because we had the same thing happen with Hellobike and uh, Mofo and, um, uh, sorry, Mobike and Ofo in, uh, in, in the Chinese bike share boom in, the, in, the, in 2015. And then subsequently as well, we've obviously seen the, the, the kind of, People have kind of got into, oh, micromobility is going to be very big and owned. And I think, you know, through that all, as you say, what's happened is we've had these big spikes in valuation, and yet there's actually been a lot of really interesting businesses that have just continued to build. And so yeah. the valuations might have gone up and down, but I think actually as businesses, we've ended up in a really interesting place. So I, I do want to kind of unpack a little bit and just say, you know, you're all different sectors, you're all different uh, geographies in many ways. Um, I'd love to just hear about what your... Like, do you think that's an accurate representation? And then what are the things that you are kind of seeing in the market? If we would like talk very broadly, um, are we, do you see that we're gonna have another sort of bubble of some regard? What would you, what, if you were to put, put, place a prediction, what do you think that would be in? And we'll, actually we'll start with Elena and we'll go this way. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. Um, I, yeah, it's, I think it's a fact that we saw that all these valuations have been dropping. Um, I think it's a big thing in micromobility, but also in the broader market. So we're seeing that companies are having difficulty raising further funding, um, but this is ev the case everywhere. I think you can say we're or close to an economic recession, and this means that there's less capital available. It will become harder to raise funding rounds. And um, yeah, investors will shy away from taking decisions lightly. Mm. So, um, and then I think if you look at micromobility uh, specifically, I think, um, yeah, a lot of these companies are hardware companies. And as they always say, hardware is hard. <laughs> and I think somewhere, yeah, somehow that is as well, it is true. There are some technological risks involved as well. And often it's also quite capital intensive. So if you know that there's going to be future funding rounds that you have to raise, that is something that um, investors will look at and think, okay, how likely do we think that these rounds are going to get raised? And that is something that is going to be looked at very critically. Um, then, um, of course, in the micromobility world now, you see a few companies having a really hard time. Mm. I don't think that is very inviting for other investors to mm. think, oh, that's where we need to be. Yes. Um, and we've seen also uh, issues in the supply chain for the past years, mm. which I think is also... Um, yeah, something that investors will look at and say, okay, is this going to be solved in the coming years? Mm. So I think um, there's still a big opportunity. As Horace said in his speech already, we think that the market is going to be there in 2050. There will be a lot more uh, micromobility riders. So I think there is a big opportunity there. I just think that on the short term, there's some um, bottlenecks. The clouds on the horizon, yeah. so to say. Yeah, absolutely. But I think if the really good companies will still get funded. Yeah, absolutely. Jorn? Yeah, I mean, ours is a very cyclical business, right? Mm. And uh, we depend, especially at Seed and Pre-Seed, we depend on blind optimism, enthusiasm. That's what gets this going, right? Maybe there was a bit too much of that in 2017, 18. I wouldn't say it was too much because I, I think you actually need that. There were a lot of reasons to be really enthusiastic. Remember, we are about financing experiments. 
That's what we do, right? So you have to look at startups that fail. Yeah, I mean, if, if no startups fail, it means you're not running experiments. You're just executing on a business strategy. You're iterating. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to try and figure out new things that can go really big, and then you adjust along the way. So I'd say for all of the experiments that were financed in that period, I mean, there was huge success. Of course, the rebound came, and then we faced some realities about, oh, cities don't love everything about this thing. Uh, that was quite clear. Uh, but it doesn't uh, invalidate the, the model of doing that. What we see right now is a combination of uh, s some slight cool down maybe on micromobility on a few areas, uh, but mainly a macro picture, right? Mm. And macro says that the risk-free alternatives are like 4 or 5%. You can buy T-bills uh, and get paid for that. So we have to deliver not only 5.5%, but considerably more. Mm. But that gets challenging. So that's where you, where you see the, the valuation compressions and, and everything. But at Seed, there is sort of a, there's a floor to how cheap a company can get. And we need to, like every Series A and Series B company will quite obviously come from Seed stage. Yeah. So this machine needs to, needs to keep on running. And it will be profitable because we look at a 10-year timeline, not next year, right? Mm -hmm. So if you keep your cool, the best companies will work. Yeah. There's a lot of pain for companies that aren't top performing right now. They will be met with some very tough questions. And they'll be asked to go profitable at Seed, which is mm. totally stupid. Totally. Kevin, is, when, were, when was Berlin? 2019? 2019. Yeah, so 2019. You remember the panel with Ali? And I said something very controversial because I said, um, too much money kills companies. Mm. And I got a lot of people coming up, you know, up to me like, what are you talking about? Well, this is what it means. Yeah. And that was that um, a lot of companies that just didn't have an ability to be profitable, to generate cash, um, and, and, you know, to scale without cash now are having, you know, substantial issues. So um, there's, still, there's still a lot of capital in the market, but in order to attract that capital, um, investors at the various stages, and for those of us that are writing, I think we all write a seed check. Mm. Right? Seriously. So, you know, we're the most optimistic of um, venture investors, but the panel, you know, if it was a panel after us of series A, B, C, discrete investors, yeah. yes. um, because some of us um, will, will write subsequent checks, you know, th they've completely changed what, what, uh, how optimistic they are about future prospects. Totally. It's totally. more hands on faces type. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I do, I do want, I, I, like I, I'm kind of curious, you, you said something really interesting, which is like one, T-bills are out there and then you can get a T-bill, treasury bill for, for 4%. And at the same time, so we have to, like in VC, you'd have to generate substantially more than that. At yeah. the same time that all the valuations are getting compressed because all of a sudden you've got a you know, change in the interest rates. Um, I, I, I do think that there's something obviously incredibly challenging about that dynamic, I'm, for, for especially when you go into hardware, especially when you go into things that are kind of operationally complex and, and you're constrained in the ability to grow really quickly. Do you see that there are any companies that are in the micromobility frame that you can see where you go, oh wow, I think that they, they're not constrained by those elements, that there's a kind of software-like returns that you can see that might exist for this or this space? But Look, every company's got that challenge, right? Mm. Um, sharing companies are actually quite capital intensive, right? So, sure. you know, if you're building a fleet of $800 scooters, um, you'll think about the capital intensity of doing that at scale. Um, we're seeing some great form factors, but if you now say it's a nine or $10,000, you know, asset sharing is really hard to scale. Mm. Um, fine, let's go to a different business model and let's be a, a subscription. Well, a subscription is still an asset financing business, yes. right? All the way to hardware. Well, then what investors will say is, well, that's a one-time sale. So what's the margin on that one-time sale and how realistic is recurring revenue? Mm -hmm. Because then everybody will say, well, you know, let's tack on some sort of recurring revenue. We see this with the automakers today. Uh, that are either enabling features or selling you, you know, data-based features, um, and how can you extract value, you know, that way. So, you know, investors want everything. Um, I'm not here to say that we're reasonable people, um, <laughs> but you know, th those are the challenges that almost every company, you know, outside um, in the hall, you know, face in terms of the kind of business model that they have, and you can't be all of those things. Yes. Yeah. So there's. 
the compression and evaluation means that uh, we, we are also advocating for, for companies to change their risk profile and to do other things, which to some degree is good. Constraints are, are good. Like to be creative, you need to have a framework, right? Yeah. And if you get too much money too fast, you'll do stupid things like hire salespeople without understanding how to sell yourself. Uh, or you'll, you'll bring on a new team of developers. They don't know what to do. Like, and and uh, team leaders will hire another set of people because that's how they are incentivized. All kinds of bullshit. So whenever a company gets too much money, they do stupid things. Well, right, right and we see that in we see that in shared. You know, yes. particularly in Germany, when you can have markets with you know nine or ten um, operators, yeah, and all of that, all, an unrestricted number of scooters, and all that does is drive the revenue per ride down, and it makes an unprofitable industry. Yes, right. Yeah. So that's the net effect of that's cheap kind of money. crappy. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of what we're looking for at seed. Uh, we shouldn't be looking for companies that, that grow uh, 10, 20 percent year on year, uh, that go for profitability. That's not the experiment we're here for. That is not venture. So, mm. so we need to be careful balancing these things. That, that, that's, I guess, part of the, the, well, what I was going after when I was asking that question is like, what is the venture backable? Because I feel in some ways what we've, we started out in many ways with shared being a venture backable business, right? And everybody went, oh my goodness, I can deploy so much capital into this thing. And everybody, you know, I think a lot of people got their, their, their um, a lot of management fees. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just, you know, it's a, it's a painful, it, it was a, like, it was a painful journey. And then I think we're seeing that perhaps now when owned, the own, and when I say owned, I mean sort of like the the, the cowboys, the 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 van moves, the, the the sort of like the darlings that managed to raise a lot of capital even two two years ago, um, and then that not the growth not being necessarily a good, their growth trajectory not being a good fit for VCs, and so I'm curious for you if there's any of any of you, is there anything that's in that micro mobility space, and it can be broad, it can be you know anything that you just think, oh yeah, that's really interesting, it meets those sort of venture. The, the characteristics of what I'd need to see for venture. I think something that we have been receiving a lot uh, and also been looking into because we do find it interesting is anything surrounding uh, components for bicycles. Mm. So of course these people know where, how to find us because the Pond Bike Group is quite substantial and mm. um, we yeah we have this network of people that of companies that work in there. Um, we're seeing a lot of, for example, newly developed drivetrains for uh, electronic bicycles. Or, um, for example, uh, I think a very good example is Classified, mm -hmm. who is a, a Belgian startup who have developed uh, uh, automatic shifting uh, technology to be built into uh, road bikes, but also gravel and mountain bike. I think these are technologies that are still being looked at a lot. There's a lot of competition in this e-bike uh, market, mm. and there's also very big players that are constantly on the lookout for the next be best technology. And I think they all have a dual strategy. On the one hand, doing the R&D themselves, trying to develop the most innovative thing, but on the other hand, constantly piloting with novel startups that have developed new technologies. And I think that's something that we're still looking into a lot. There's a balance here in between looking at the, the concrete cases that can be venture scale, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a serious A job. I don't understand that. I only understand seed. But yep. then there's the other thing of, of looking at the category as a whole. I, I guess we'll get into that. But like the, this promise that we're reshifting and reshaping the entire mobility and transportation sector, we need to. It's a mathematical necessity. Mm -hmm. and that's what our cities dictate. If you look at the ARPU of a, of a car owner, like, those are insane numbers, right? Yeah. You look at the kind of, uh, kind of money. In Norway, we're where we come from in our base, I think the average family car will cost you 9,000 euros per year. That's a good chunk of money. That's for one car. Mm -hmm. Family often has two cars. So now you have that kind of money to play around with. You can, you can push a lot of great services within that budget, right? You can do a whole bunch of things. So we know those things to be true. We know that this entire field is being reshaped. And in a few decades, everyone or everything that is interesting will happen in or with cities. And urbanization sort of dictates the number of atoms we can move around here. So we know that's going to happen. Question is, will we find venture scale timeline companies that we can invest in right now? Mm. That's the challenging part, you know, the timing of that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, but I'm still like today, um, we need to be looking at companies that are doing something fundamental, not incremental. Yes. Right. So the incrementals never materialize in anything exciting. Um, there's got to be real scale behind what they're doing. <laughs> And, um, you know, and I would say the third thing is that 
Uh, it, it, it's kind of like a, a painkillers versus the vitamins. Yes. Right. So it's got to be a need to have, not a nice to have. Yeah. The nice to haves are the sort of luxury when there's a lot of cash flowing around in a tight cash environment. It's got to be a need to have. I mean, in some ways, it struck me that like the last, especially the last year in Europe, has been e-mobility, lightweight electric mobility has been like a total need to have <laughs> when you're yeah. when you're, when the cost to fill up a car is yeah. you know as expensive as it is and people are looking for alternatives and yet and I and I think we can start to see that with some of these businesses but again it's it's like you're up, you might be up 20% or 30% on a year when you're selling an e-bike but it's it's that's not like up 100% on a year on year that a VC would look at and say I'm really excited about this so I can't wait to like throw money at you and uh yeah, I mean... Uh, well, there aren't that many businesses that have you know, 95 plus percent margins. Yes. Right. But still, you have to reconcile the fact that this is a, it's a very, very large TAM, mm -hmm. very large addressable market. Yes. Um, what I worry about is that it is um, highly fractionalized, right? Highly fragmented. Yeah. Highly fragmented. And how do you create a dominant... Uh, player in a fragmented, in a multiple fragmented markets. Yes. Yeah. That, I don't have the answer to that. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> Tell us. That's, Tell us well, that's why I'm up here and I'm yeah. not a founder. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious as to if you could give me uh, a, a kind of, you mentioned this earlier, Lena, which is Horace has said, look, we're going to have 5 billion riders by 2050. And that I think is a really, uh, that number is like totally unfathomable. We have 5 billion phones, but we only have 1 billion cars. His thesis, of course, is that these vehicles, like everybody will end up with a micromobility vehicle and it'll be 5 billion and we'll replace them every three to four years. So like the size of that market will be massive. Um, and that's 2050. And as you were saying, you know, we've kind of got the short term crunch on everything. Um, what's the, you know, like, how would you, yeah, how, how do you kind of look at that problem and go, is there, what, what gives you hope and what, and what constrains you in terms of thinking about making investments? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, we have always, as Ponuk being, uh, we, we can get, uh, we are, we're called traditional at some point. So I think for us, the type of investments that we do or the way we look at it isn't that uh, different than it was before. Uh, these constraints. So we want to see a team that we really believe in, that have a product that we believe will be really successful. And um, yeah, we're Series A investors, so I think it's a bit different, but especially now, although uh, I might be stating the obvious by saying this, we are looking at a clear pathway to profitability, yep. to be honest. And we are looking at uh, good unit economics, and there has to be a sustainable competitive advantage. Mm. I think that's just what we're looking at still, and we're still deploying capital, we're still doing deals. Mm. Um, so we still believe that there are companies uh, that can make it and that we do believe that can also raise future rounds. Mm. But I think you just have to remain critical. And, and yeah, I think the three points I mentioned, those are things that we really look at very diligently at this point. Yeah, I'm sorry. So sure. it's helpful here to, to remember what we do, right? We place bets on the future. We don't know if companies work. The founders don't either, right? So we, we try to figure out what has a decent chance of becoming a great business. Mm -hmm. That is what we're investing for, right? And you only figure out if it works after you've done that experiment. And, and within that, we try to find S-curves. We try to find where rapid growth is happening, where you have these, these grounds for, for making incredible businesses work. That's what we have here right now. We don't know what the form factor will be. So we'll have to place bets on different things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're, that's what we're doing. It's helpful then also to remember that the only things that will work are things that are better. So all the people that converted to micro-ability because they felt an obligation to their fellow citizens for not being like loud assholes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. they've already done that. You're not yeah. going to recruit any new customers in that group. You can only win if you do something that is better, is fundamentally better. Is it cheaper? Is it more fun? Uh, is it more efficient? Whatever. It, it needs to be better. But those solutions are here, right? Mm. So for that part, yeah, deploy a whole bunch of cash, run all these different experiments, 
and, and see what's going on. We know some of the mathematical necessities. We don't know how it's going to play out, but that's unknowable at our sector. Mm. You can only figure out after you've done it. I mean, in theory, you want to have a thesis, right? But like you, want to, you want to be able to point to it and say, we think that there's all the, all the kind of characteristics of why this would grow into so, the S-curve, right? So the, the thesis is, uh, I mean, you can, you can go into detail in describing, uh, for ours, it's a, it's a climate impact thesis. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you don't need more arguments to think uh, that urbanization is probably happening mm. or that the private car ownership model is not a great fit for the 21st century city. Like, mm. those things are done. You don't need more evidence. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's somewhere else. That's not the bottleneck. Fair enough. Kevin? The, um, the myth, though, about early stage investing is that we have this golden or uh, crystal ball, yeah. right, to be able to see where the future lies. But it, yeah. It, in reality, what we're really doing is we're picking founders mm. because the likelihood that the business, you know, that you, that the founder brings to you and that you agree to finance, the likelihood that that is the business that becomes the billion dollar company is pretty slim, mm. right? So um, the reality is you're picking people who have a great idea and have a reasonable chance and we think the thesis all fits. Um, but if the market doesn't uh, evolve this, the way we all think it will, um, or the technology doesn't materialize, can that team, uh, you know, figure out the path? And ultimately, uh, that's what it's about. Yep. yep. I think that's helpful advice for any founder here. The investors invest in people. <laughs> yeah, it's totally. Well, actually, that's where there I isn't a lot of other stuff. That's where I wanted to go with this. Um, so, you know, look, we've got a whole bunch of startup entrepreneurs in the audience. I would love to hear your you know what? Like, what would you recommend? G given that you're, you oh, know, well, in some ways, gatekeepers of capital. No, right? okay, but we're the last people in the world to give that advice. Okay, beautiful. Right? Because, <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, I have, I, I have no idea what the future holds. Mm. But what I do is I meet founders and I look at what it is that they're working on because the founders are actually creating the future. Mm. They're the ones who are responding to the opportunity in the marketplace. We're just the funders. We're just the enablers. Totally. So, yes, but how do they help you enable them? Um, well, by, you know, articulating. I, I, I think all of the, the points that have been raised here, right? Um, it, it, there has to be, you know, profitable unit economics. There has to be profitable growth potential. There's got to be a big market. Mm. Um, all, all the things that we've said, you know, already in a nutshell, that's yeah. what has to be presented in an effective way. And... Uh, just because I, you know, don't think it's interesting doesn't mean that someone else doesn't think it is. Yeah. I did the numbers a year ago, and I, I've seen well over two and a half thousand pitches. Uh, I think most ideas are, are good. Like, it's fine. I have no idea if it works. I mean, it's entirely true. We don't know. Mm. That's not the bet we're making. And, and so it's very, very important to be, to be aware of that. No one can know. I mean, that's why you have to do it, to figure it out. And then it helps to, to do the other things. That's also why we can't really, you, we can't do Article 9 classification at pre-seed seed. seed. I mean, you don't know what the business is. There is no unit economics to analyze. There are no assets to figure out. Uh, I mean, you, you bet on the company trying to figure out how to move in this industry. That's what you're doing. Okay. Anything you'd add? No, I think uh, I've mentioned most of it already. So yep. we as Series A, we look at, we do look at a clear path to profitability, unique economics. Um, yeah, do we believe you as a team? Are you going to make it happen? I think that's one of the most important things. Beautiful. Well, we've got a couple of minutes left. I just want to have sort of like any closing thoughts on uh, the market or, or, or micromobility in general, like the thesis. I mean, you clearly, I want to ask you, Kevin, because I know you like, you went very gung-ho into bird. I'm kind of curious as to where your view is now of micro. Oh, I'm I'm very supportive. So you know, I drink the Kool Aid from Horace. I mean, don't um, we? down yeah. the hall. Yeah. It's <laughs> um, so I'm a I'm a I'm a believer. Um, I I don't hope though. I don't hope is yep. not a strategy. And there's a great um, YouTube video on that. Yes. Um, so I'm I'm, I, I'm very very bullish. But again, um, there there are structural adjustments that are taking place in the market. <laughs> right. So I am I'm a, an adherent to the belief that, you know, we'll we'll have very successful uh, players in sharing um, in in subscription and in owned vehicles and that we will slice that by the various form factors. So I believe that that's the, the construct. Um, 
but I just I wouldn't rely upon um, looking at at market cap degradation or stock performance for any of these companies um, that are just too mature immature yet. Uh, but I'm very bullish on the prospects. Fantastic, thank you, Jorn. There's never been a better time to build. That's clear. And within your building startups, climate tech is the most exciting uh, whole category. And within that, you need to solve energy and mobility to do everything else. Mm. And energy is sort of hidden to a lot of uh, a lot of people. Mobility concerns everyone. It impacts everyone. Every human being on Earth has an opinion about mobility and how to move around. It's super exciting. Really, really investable. Um, I can't think of a better place to be. Fantastic. Okay. Elena? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of good things have been said. So all I uh, want to add is we're still actively investing. So if you have a great proposition, do reach <laughs> out and uh, happy to take a look at it. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, look, uh, folks, please give them a hand, this fantastic panel of mine, uh, Elena, Jorn, and Kevin.